Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, everyone, to the philosophy of artless science. As always, you can join the YouTube channel directly at even a dollar a month to give back, or head over to oxum.substack.com or patreon.com slash oxum. Today's returning guest is Diak On Adamasalase. Welcome back to the program. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And this time I have a gift to the Ethiopian church from you, the letter that kills variant readings of Genesis 37.3 in the Andimta corpus. I, I want this to be semi standalone, but I don't want to rehash everything that we've um, done before. So could you reintroduce yourself as I was pleased to see the meet the author section at the back of the book? Can you um, introduce yourself and talk about how a person interested in the natural sciences could also be interested in the school of biblical exegesis from the motherland? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think you mean the, the uh, well, I guess they, they categorize the, uh, everything as the natural sciences, but it would be specifically the physical sciences. Um, uh, I think it's the um, classical, um, what's, uh, what is it? The classical uh, um, understanding where you have um, the Renaissance combination of uh, chemistry and mathematics and and physics and religion, uh, especially if if you look back to like Isaac Newton before things were so specialized that um, they were their own branches and uh, difficult to be accessible uh, in, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, but you know, I, I think it's that's what it is. It's it's the interest of all things that um, truth and science and, and uh, poetry and, and religion, I think the mind is desires to understand all things. I, I think it's very natural and um, you know, the epitome is the Renaissance. That, that's good. So I think you have a very strong classical argument for there that these things aren't as separate as they are, but it's all under the idea of seeking kind of truth in, in all of its manifestations. But I have to say, because I think you and I have gotten to this, and we've, we're going to look at a few figures that I think highlight this point as well. But um, I want to say that that's not that common. Am I wrong in that? Do you see yourself... Uh, people who are other aerospace engineers working on embedded spacecraft flight software who are also interested in Oriental Orthodox Christianity or even Christianity, you know, as a broader thought? Not not at all. <clears throat> I, I don't think it's common. And I, I, I think that's why you and I are often in dialogue because uh, we don't have we don't have an, a, a, another medium on which to, you know, we don't have a set. We don't have a place. Um, uh, to discuss and grow in these ideas. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's fair. So bringing it back again to your book, and again, I don't want to repeat too much of what we've said before, but we've talked a lot about how when you were un uh, younger, you were more interested in, I think it's, it's fair to say, although it could come off uh, pejoratively, uh, the smells and bells of the church, which is to say the sort of the outward melodies and and the hymns of the church which have great importance and we know saint ephraim the syrian um he had like kind of bible studies but he also had these liturgical studies in co-ed communities so you know it's not that they're diametrically opposed but i think um often you find people specializing back home and somehow you spent you spent a lot of time learning the the intricate very intricate melodies of the church and i'm sure you could tell us too and i've seen some of the musical notations you've even handwritten and would share uh in public and i always enjoy those but you also found time to just go because you're talking about religion as a field you you know you did that from a kind of musical point of view but now you've become extremely textual what was that something that you saw as a smooth transition or what can you say about that no i don't think it was a smooth transition um I think it was a necessary. You can only get so far with with the 
sensual with the with with the sense experience um and but i think that's the first experience uh through childhood uh, everyone has um fond uh, memories of the frankincense a anyone that's grown up i think in the in the oriental uh, orthodox churches or in any of the apostolic churches you know there's a there's a reminiscent um uh uh it, it, it just it, just a sense experience that occurs um and the music is on the same line you know it's the ears the the nose the eyes the beauty the exterior uh beauty and the cultic um not in a pejorative uh uh, uh term i think that term is has a negative context a connotation um um among uh, lay lay people of biblical studies i think cult is a very uh, the temple cult it, 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 it's it's a normal uh thing but uh so the transition is a bit rather than like a charismatic leader who's uh almost always ends up getting the girls <laughs> yeah so a, a, a focus on the uh liturgical uh uh, uh temple or uh, that type of religious expression as opposed to uh yeah the a focus on the preacher and his um eloquence of his words or persona um but yeah it's it i think it was a rough transition uh honestly because um you and uh, others have uh a interest that i know have an interest um particularly in linguistics and that that is a tra trajectory that'll take you towards um the study of literature uh for me the study of languages which uh, you and uh, another friend of ours have pushed me towards was um, out of an interest for the literature, which it you know I can't tell you when it happened because I think it was a very gradual, uh, maybe five to s seven year period where you, uh, moving slowly away from the uh, the musical uh, focus uh, in, into more of a textual focus. Uh, as as an expression of um, religious scholarship, um, it, it it took a it took a good amount of time and a good amount of pressure. Yeah, that's fair, and that's how diamonds are made, right? Is through the pressure, through the through the rough, and and it's interesting. I don't want you to sell yourself short because you might not be as uh, obsessed in the finer points of of language as others, but you know. Uh, my my language palette uh, pales in comparison to Mahari. And then when we get to you, even at your base, before you started looking into the biblical languages, you already had Gizamarinya and English, all, you know, at different levels. But being a diasporic deacon for decades helps you kind of practice those those three things. To get into the text itself, as I said, the other video we made discussed the literature review. So we will be skipping that and entering into chapter two i was hoping you could give kind of a gursha of each chapter to the audience to entice them to purchase the book and we'll uh, plug it again at the end and have an amazon link up hopefully wherever this video is and uh, perhaps the audio as well if i'm able to separate that chapter two is titled the early church and variants in the septuagint and this this word variant comes up as well in the uh, subtitle of the book itself. Can you just talk about what the Septuagint is and what variants are? Yeah, so the Septuagint is a Greek rendering, uh, rendering of the Hebrew, and it was a um, translation uh, that was made for Jews, uh, by Jews, um, around, uh, after the uh, conquest of the known world by Alexander and the spread of Hellenic culture. Hellenic, um, as in uh, Greek, for uh, those that might not know what that term refers to. Um, so, it's a it's a version that we would have seen um, a version of the Old Testament text that we would have seen does not include the New Testament. Septuagint does not refer to the New Testament. Uh, and so it's a version that we would have encountered if we were um, alive as Jews or Christians 
in the first, second, or third century, it, it's a very common, not the only translation, um, and but but a very common one, and and one that seems to have been quoted by the gospel authors, um, and and uh, it, very importantly, also Paul, uh, and. I understand that it was a labored. Uh, I, I call, it's called. It's, it's better expressed as a rendering because uh, it is focused on um, word order, not necessarily uh, um, a translation at a sentence or phrase level, um, more so at a word level. Uh, and um, variants are, um, I think, something that uh, for lay people that are interested in the Bible, I think it's something that uh, would come as a shock, but something that is very normal uh, for those who engaged in uh, the biblical text up until at least the development or, or yeah, at least the development of the uh, printing press uh, because the Bible was um, copied uh, and um, preserved in a, Manu manuscript culture and um, what you have is are, are people uh, laboriously copying uh, versions of the biblical text and um, what when you have that you end up with uh, some places that are worded differently some wordings may be unimportant uh, others uh, may point to uh, especially in the context of the Septuagint may Variants may point to the um, earlier uh, Hebrew text that the Greek versions were um, uh, translated from. And uh, uh, so Septuagint and variants, um, I think these are two things that are very important, very important points to at least have heard of. Uh, for anyone that is interested in um, having a a serious, a good level of biblical literacy. Yeah, you often hear in American Christian circles the idea of the infallibility of the Word of God. I remember, uh, and we'll get back to one of the figures, one of the figures you quote from, I remember even, talks about the erroneousness of the text. Uh, and and seeing the defectiveness of it and seeing the variance, it, were you ever concerned for your own faith when seeing these variants? Did it shake it in any way? And is there any concern of um, of of the audience receiving it in that way? Obviously, you can't control people, but um, I mean, not not that many people read anyway. I like to say that the the allergy for reading may be greater than things like pollen and peanuts and other stuff. Hmm. Um, so to begin with, I, th I think serious, um, um, any religious scholarship or theological scholarship, um, I, th I think, you know, it is, um, it is, it is, it, it's like playing with fire. I think, I think, you know, it, it's not easy. Um, if you are concerned with what the outcome is going to be at the end, like in terms of your faith uh, and so on. Uh, biblical scholarship, I think, is rough on um, of those uneasy uh, about, about their faith. Um, I don't think it's unclear what the uh, paradigm is in my book, uh, because mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's my argument is that these variants have always existed. And um, even the the question, the, epi the epistemological question, or um, I don't know if that's a British way of conjugating that word, um, uh, and not an American. I've, I've, I think the uh, the American English uh, does it differently. But the um, the epistemic question is that right? Is that the is that the American English? I've heard both. In this case, I often actually know the British and the American, and I favor the American almost every time. Like toward versus towards and stuff like that. That and this one I don't know. So, so the question of of the capacity of the text in terms of its language to reveal God, um, the the ancient church um, 
is very clear on its perspective about that. So I don't leave, I don't leave the the reader dangling or anything. I think it's hard it's hard enough to engage in this research yourself, um, and uh, you know you you see what the cost is because uh, you know this isn't something I just uh, put together in a year or two. Uh, this took a little bit of time, and then even after it was it was done. Um, it was submitted as a, as a thesis, but you know it was edited to be accessible. Um, so I don't leave it up to the reader. Uh, I, I direct the reader to the sources of the early church and um, the later church, um, and how it viewed um, these and preserved the variants. I mean, these aren't. It's not like we didn't know about these things and um, it's not like they're not preserved. So in this, in the, in chapter two, I think it's, it's chapter two, that's the, uh, so the Septuagint and its variants. Mm -hmm. um, it is a study on the early church and how it preserved through manuscript culture, um, through manuscript transmission of the text, how it preserved uh, the, variants that it found in the Greek version of the Old Testament and um, why it preserved that, the, the question, the philosophical question, like how did they see these things? Um, so the the way they believe God was revealed um, through the text is not how we see it. Um, so you wouldn't, we wouldn't even have the, a discussion about biblical iner inerrancy because it just didn't exist and I don't even call it that in my writing because it would be projecting a, a 20th, 21st century or 19th century uh, question onto a work that's looking at uh, first, second, third century biblical scholarship and even 16th and then 16th, 17th century um, uh, Ethiopian biblical scholarship. And this just term, I don't, I didn't find it anywhere. So I didn't take it, I didn't copy the question from, um, I think it's probably from uh, scholasticism, I'm not sure, from uh, the Roman church or the Protestant church. Um, that word, biblical inerrancy, uh, you won't find it. I don't use it. Um, and so if you start from the first century, uh, which is kind of where the context starts for uh, chapter two, uh, you don't see these these words. You see the text. You see the the the, the various versions that uh, I'll drop a name here. Origin of Alexandria. That was my next question. Yeah, go ahead. So you see the various versions that uh, he is consulting uh, side by side together, and also a uh, 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 a Hebrew version. And um, you see him collecting, and collecting for interpretation uh, the variants that occur in some of the readings. It's not like these things are all over the place. They, they, um, they're localized, and so he collected them. And then this, even though his work disappeared, the variants that he collected were preserved through um, or an Oriental church. Uh, the Syrian church in its Syrio, hex Syrio hexapla, where it copied these variants uh, and kept them. And then uh, in, in subsequent chapters, we see um, uh, one example that pops up in the 16th, 15th, 16th, 17th century Ethiopia, and uh, you find it um, uh, being used to change the reading of a chapter of Genesis. Yeah, it's amazing. I've seen images of the Hexapolis as well, and they're just amazing to see. Um, e these characters that you select, they're they're very interesting. There is, and I, I think you you answered my first question there very well. Um, Mahadi to some brothers when he was summarizing your book called it uh, this this thread of struggle between folkloric biblical literalism faithfulness and in that early church period you you had these two figures origin and saint ephraim the syrian the savvy hearers will notice that we didn't say saint origin so 
can you talk about the way you're able to look at him? Because like Father Paul Nadim Tarazi looks at a person like Origen and, um, you know, frankly finds like the universalism heretical as other people have pointed to as well. And a lot of the other conclusions to be bad, but appreciates the methodology and especially his interest in studying the original biblical languages and, and finding these manuscript variants and all, which are necessary parts of trying to get at the meaning of God's message to humanity through through these texts. I'm wondering, because you have them, these two figures kind of side by side, but obviously our church and, and we treat them differently. What you thought of uh, at looking at the scholarship of Origen and looking at the scholarship of Ephraim the Syrian? So, you know, Origen's work stands uh, stands uh, strong in and of itself. I mean, it's it's almost a uh, a, a, a work of philology. Um, he's creating a critical addition uh, to the if we can call it that, the, the best reading possible of the um, Old Testament. And so it doesn't matter who he is, um, his work is his work. Um, so, but then it, when comparing um, St. Ephraim the Syrian, uh, who is a saint in the, the Oriental Orthodox, the, uh, the um, Greek Orthodox and the Catholic, I believe, also in the Catholic churches, and just, I think right. all all the Apostolic churches. Period. I think he's he's considered a saint. Um, um, his 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 work is is uh, used as a backup, like you know, as a secondary, um, and beyond even uh, origin. Um, I'm looking at his commentary and his thought on on the language. But I but I did the same for. I did the same for Origen also. Uh, beyond both of them, though, is the text itself. Uh, the important thing is, like, what is the text saying? Um, what is it getting at? What is its context? Who is its audience? What What does the text mean? Not what Not Not what 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 are we? You know, we have to be careful to uh, not project our own questions onto it. Mm -hmm. We have to look at what it's saying, and so that is the the, the main center of of all of of this, the, the, this scholarship, you know, its aim is the text as the, as the source. And so, you know, these works just stand, um, I, I don't, I don't even impose their, what, what they're saying onto the text. It's, uh, th that's, that's the flow of logic here is like, it's, this is the study of the text, not what someone in the third century thought of it necessarily. That's, that's a wonderful way of putting it. And you have here a quote from St. Ephraim from Sebastian Brock's The Luminous Eye, the spiritual world vision of St. Ephraim, the Syrian, and Sebastian Brock, fascinating figure, world's leading Syriac scholar, never leaves the Anglican church, but receives the title Malfono, or teacher, from our from the Syriac church, the West Syriac, which is in communion with us. And you have this quote from there, which uh, he uses this language frequently, because I don't have that book, but I've seen this language frequently. He clothed himself in our language so that he might clothe us in his mode of life. And you comment on here about how uh, the words of scripture are intended to convey a revelation to humanity. I wonder if you have anything to say about that. I found that line very beautiful. Yeah. Um the, the this line of thought, this clothing, declothing, um, uh, Syriac theology, uh, and it, it, it's it's an understanding of the language, right? Uh, so I'm not even using that to say what the Bible is. Um, it is an understanding of the language of the Bible. Uh, so later on, I also look at Yenita Henok, uh, who is a, a scholar uh, 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 who, who passed away um, not too long ago, but of the uh, non-Eucharistic liturgies. And his perspective is that the, the text conveys to us the customs of God, because it's, the, it's talking about the relationship of Yahweh and certain people. And so in, in certain stories, you see certain aspects of, of of god and in certain stories you see other aspects and 
overall, the Old Testament is a history of God with with this chosen people of of the of Israel, and so um, so my my comment there is that like, what is the what is the the scripture? It's revealing a person, a being. So we don't, you know, we don't worship a text. Uh, it's there as instruction from the being that revealed it. You see what I'm saying? Even in the New Testament, we don't have a text to worship. We have a church. We have a church, which is a collective body, just like the Old Testament Israel. It's literally called Israel according to the Spirit. In, in in Paul's interpretation. So what is given to the Israel according to the spirit, to this people, because the church is not a building, it's a it's a people that are tied into a pact, a covenant um, with this person. What is handed over to them is another uh, set of canonical texts, the New Testament. And so we're, we don't have a text to worship, we, you know, we have a text that is written in the context of a relationship between humans and uh, the divine being, Yahweh, um, and so on, uh, in the various names that you have for God and the various um, uh, persons of, of the Trinity uh, when you get to the New Testament uh, um, text. And so it's, it is a vehicle that is used for a being that is on a completely different mode of existence. If you read on, Ephraim says that we're on a separate side of a chasm of being. So that can't even, you know, a chasm that, that, that can't be crossed. So, um, so th this is what the text is. It is about a being that requests uh, a covenant relationship uh, with the people that this text is written towards and that that text lays out the details of that covenant and the nature the um, not the nature I mean to say the customs I, I think that's that's a perfect way of saying it the customs of the one who is uh, conversing with humanity and Ephraim says, you know, he put on our language, and our language uh, is not um, um, is not uh, to be tied to his nature. You you can read it there in the exact quote. Um, I'm I'm paraphrasing. Um, it does not pertain to his being. The language does not pertain to his being. So even the text, it doesn't suit him. Uh, and so Ephraim goes on to say uh, that it's as it's as if speaking to a child. What 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 Yahweh did with Israel? It was it was how it was in the same way that an adult speaks to a child, and and you uh, as as a recent father, you understand that um, you can't talk to me like you talk to your son. Is you know it does, and, and the way you talk to your son does not pertain to you and who you are and your language. So you're stup You're coming down to communicate with um, a baby and it, it, it's the same uh, metaphor that, uh, that you know the text is trying it, it is a vehicle uh, because we can't we're not able to speak God's language God speaks ours and that's done uh, in order to present to us who he who he is how he acts and things about him um, that are necessary that's right. Er, very well said. Early on in my Orthodox Christian study of scripture, I was a big listener or hearer of Dr. Jeannie Constantinou's work, and she used the technical term condescension to describe what you're saying. The idea that he's coming down to our level. My first job out of college was with AmeriCorps as well, and I was working in an education nonprofit in a, in a public school in, in Watts. And uh, one of the things they would tell us is you don't really know something unless you could explain it to a fourth grader or, you know, insert third grader, first grader. You, you know, you talked about my son. He's under a year right now. So uh, obviously understands a lot less. 
Um, but yeah, that's an excellent way of expressing it. And moving on to chapter three, chapter three is titled The Bible and the Ethiopian Church. You make this movement in your text, which is much like my sermons, so the strategy of my, my homilies, which is to begin with the universal and then to get more narrow into the particular. And so you, you've told us about uh, a category of an umbrella category that covers even Jews and Christians in terms of their usage of the LXX or the old Greek or the Septuagint. And that is certainly the major influence upon the biblical texts received in Ethiopia, but it's not the sole influence. It's not just a copy paste. Could you talk about other influences on the biblical texts and variants received by the church in Ethiopia? Uh, so the variants, you want me to talk about the variants or? Or just whatever other languages they're receiving texts from. Uh, so we're sticking to texts still and not commentary, if I'm, if, if, to be clear, right? Y yeah. So, uh, yeah, so um, Greek is, is certainly looks like the main uh, 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 translation that the Ethiopic made. Um, so Greek, it looks like Greek uh, Vorlagen or source texts. And then there are obviously other languages because you find in certain books of the Bible, uh, remember the Bible is a library. Um, and so you find Arabic uh, in some suggestions of Hebrew and Syriac uh, depending on the, the time period and whatever was going on. And um, I don't think there's any consistency uh, as, as it, it wasn't like the church um, decided to revise everything uh, and had an order to, to call together um, scholars and know that it's not that. I think it's various times and the, and, and the translators are talented in different ways. Some don't know what they're doing. Uh, some are very skilled, and um, even when you look at those who are commenting on the text, like the, the great scholar Memher Erzdros, he's even, uh, you know, looking at the text, and he's like, "I'm," he's not wasting his ingenuity on interpreting a defective text. Those are his words, uh, and instead, he is aiming to find a more accurate readings, and so. Um, this isn't, uh, this isn't an, an opinion that I have. This is just, this is the data, the, te the textual data shows this, the, those who, who forged the commentary tradition, they know this and they've said this and I've quoted them. Um, uh, even the different sides, you know, there, there's two main groups of biblical commentary, uh, scholarship uh, that's traditional to the, to, to, um, or indigenous, the indigenous scholarship, and they both see that there's issues with the Giz texts. And, um, and uh, this is, I'm going all, all on, on a tangent right here, just from the point that those who tr made the translations were skilled at various levels and some were not that skilled. And, and, and this is reflected even by the, those who commented on the text, but the, the primary um, language uh, uh, as it, fr f of the sources that, that the is was translated from is is Greek and um, there have been edits made to it in light of Hebrew and uh, Arabic uh, and maybe Syriac. Thank you. I, I'm so glad you made that distinction early on between commentary and text itself. I think it's one of the main things that I took away from your project that I learned that was brand new. Some of it was repeat, but uh, that was certainly novel uh, to me. And then you're mentioning of Mamher Esteros or Professor Esteros. I want to come back to him. But first, I want to talk about um, Professor Kidana Wood Kufle and his teacher, uh, Professor Kufle Georgis, as well. And what's fascinating, I think, about his life is that uh, both of them were, you know, kind of exiled and had their own theological issues. But I appreciate how you focus on, like you said, the work of the man himself rather than the historical or biographical details that could distract from the um, the actual work that they did. And especially, I think, Kitana Wal Kifle, 
his life sounds like an Indiana Jones film, just the way he went out of his way to hunt down a commentary on Ezekiel and to, to prepare that for the church. And actually, I, <laughs> I have it, I have one with me right, right here with the great wheel of Ezekiel. <laughs> so uh, that's one of my favorite things. And of course, I named my, my son after him as well. And uh, shout out to my wife who believes it was her idea. But... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, could you tell the audience about uh, a couple of these great men, about Kidana Wodkufle and Kufle Georgis? And it, it, it took me a lot of uh, self-control to not uh, say something while you're speaking, because uh, um, I, I, you know, I, I enjoyed just now listening to your summary. But I wanted to say to you that everyone was exiled. Um, everyone. That uh, I that I I think I think everyone that I mentioned in the book has, was exiled. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, or the abbot in in Wakom, the, the legendary abbot of Debra Divanos, he was exiled. Uh, he was asked by the um, king uh, he, uh, of his time after his exile to return, and and, and he uh, I believe he um, turned that offer down. Merkadingel, who appears in the, the the last uh chapter um he was exiled uh, he, he ch i think he chose exile to it seems maybe to even to the same region that his teacher who was who was the the who i just mentioned the uh, abbot of uh the Debra Dumanus monastery uh abbot uh uh in Bakom. I, so I, I think they were they both chose exile to a similar region the north um Western region of uh, the border of, of Gondor and uh, Sudan, uh, Kadan Wald Kifle was exiled. It, whether you know, I think I think his was a uh, self-imposed uh, exile. I'm not sure. His his was in Harar. Uh, so Esdros exiled himself to the um, monasteries of um, of um, Lake Tana. Um, his his was also more of a uh, self-imposed exile uh because his ideas were he, he you know he just thought like that he, this work of commentary has to be fixed some people didn't like some of his students didn't like it i don't think he really had peers uh he was that that much of, of a great scholar he you know he appears in every single one of the uh they call them tridents of Ma of of masters, he's everywhere. If you, th that you see the succession of the great teachers of the Old Testament or the New Testament or patristic texts or the monastic texts, he's everywhere. His name appears in in all of the references to the great teachers. And so, the I think, I think it's the nature of the society that you know exiles these people. Yeah, it's it's very sad. You know, I'm I'm just looking here. Within chapter three, you have a, a portion where, for example, um, Abba Georgis of Sagla, of whom Mahari is writing about, and we'll look forward to his dissertation on the subject, is uh, his book of mysteries. His Mas'afa Mister is one of the targets of of criticism. There's there's nothing that's not a target of criticism, and so um, in a culture and society where the tallest blade of grass can get cut down, which is, is usually said of of certain Anglo and Scandinavian societies, but I think there's a little bit of that in our Afro-Asiatic society as well. It's um, it's not surprising if you don't mind me asking. Then are you ready? Are you ready for exile if you're not already in exile? I'm, I think I'm I'm a self-imposed uh, exile. Um, I, I I I what you just quoted, you know, was criticized. So Abba Gurkiz's Mesafa Mister or the Book of Mysteries was criticized by uh, Al Akidan or Kifle. And it was criticized not just not just his text, but um, Nub um, Nubura Id. I forget the name; it's on there. Nubura Id um, Isaac is that yeah Isaac, uh, who wrote the hagiography of Kostos, um, and who perpetuates a myth of a biblical source text. Um, uh from uh a hebrew uh um of uh, uh um, um vorlog he just beats he beats he beats him up right there he's like that is just an obvious lie 
you 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 have not seriously looked at the text which um derives all nouns not from hebrew but from greek and he's saying that the 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 story the folklore of a biblical source coming from hebrew during the period of the uh king solomon the son of uh king david in he's saying this is just a blatant lie and he's telling us when it got started also um it got started by people who and and this is a phenomena that occurs now it's clergy who write text in their in their own name uh, without a critique of their peers uh and the church has to carry that and so you know uh even chapter three when it starts out talking about where did the ethiopic text of the bible uh where was it translated from where where, where you know it, it it's saying that the myth came from people who wrote books in their own name and propagated it within the church mm -hmm. namely the hagiography of Kostos and the Book of Mysteries of uh, Abba Georgis. Uh, so, uh, again, those are not my words; those are Al Kidan Wal uh words. And and you you know you see a pattern that exists now. Uh, there are there there it's the same thing now. People writing their own ideas into the dialogue of. Uh, the church, but it's not the church's dialogue. It's their own. It's 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 things of their own making, and, and you know, gets thrown into the whirlwind of you know the theological whirlwind of uh, of um, the, the the church. And uh, you know, I, I had to say that because you, you you read that quote, and the magnitude of that quote, uh, sh you know, should be emphasized. Ab absolutely, and these large texts that you have from it just as a reminder to people is in Amharic because this tradition is and I have to emphasize it as a language buff in Giz and in Amharic in medieval Ethiopia and at a time where there are a lot of other languages and people may be speaking other languages but they write in Giz and in Amharic in the same way the early Egyptians were um, their language of education was Greek and some of the North African fathers outside of Egypt their language was Latin because that was the kind of uh, language of scholarship of their of their purview. So they could have been from a number of different, you know, tribes or ethnicities, although they may be more of one than the other, but they're writing this in Giz and in Amharic. And you mentioned both Mamhur Hanok, uh, not talking about me, and, and uh, Mamhur Esdaros earlier. Was there anything else about either of these figures that you wanted to say or emphasize that we didn't get to earlier? Yeah, so so uh, let let me just say some closing thoughts about uh, Memher Esteros, and let me be clear that Memher Henok um, is a was was a more recent was a more recent not a biblical scholar necessarily. I'm not he might be, but I'm not quoting him uh, as one. Um, I, I was quoting his canticles, some of the canticles. Um, um, Memher Esteros uh, was a was a Gondarin uh, from the Gondarin period, and his ideas um i show to be consistent with the with the mechanism under which the ethiopian commentary tradition corrects the biblical text and it, it's not only one mechanism it's several uh when i say mechanism i mean technical approaches or for, formulaic stylistic methods under which the text is clearly critiqued and corrected um one of those is one of those mechanisms is the way it's corrected uh through ancient readings one of those is a way it's simply corrected by the interpreter and and the interpreter says uh that's not what it, it what, what it means to say is this so these mechanisms show that the criticism that memher esdros had of the biblical text is a method of interpretation that is now embedded in the commentary tradition and i prove that with ex with literary examples from uh old testament commentary on uh the book of samuel and it's a very interesting example because it clearly shows um 
that that they had even before the printed edition uh, this approach where they would correct these manuscripts that they had you know now we have printed editions but they had manuscripts and so they would correct it um the gospel of i have an example from the gospel of john a commentary on the gospel of john that shows um how they would correct the text through um uh, readings uh, old readings that they found from patristic uh commentary and so they're t they're looking at the text that the uh people in the patristic period uh third fourth fifth century had and um and an and example from the book of monks and so inescapable is the fact that those engage in the tradition now it's right there that these texts are corrected and and they're not assumed to be uh completely accurate and there's an approach to this um and so you, you know it it's embedded in the style of exegesis yes and and um I have, and people could look this up once they purchased a book as well. Here, I think that's First Samuel twenty three fourteen. You have Wanavara with the Gadam, Gadam is eight, and you're comparing it to the Greek of the Septuagint. You have Wanavara Dawit with the Gadam Zamaseret, and the interpretation you have Zamaseret Sil Sagwan Yemitad Dinibet, and other um, explanations of this. I think it's an important time to also jump in. Um, because the technical terms that are used also in this tradition sometimes are used, I think, loosely by people not super involved in the tradition. And that's something I also picked up from your project of Tirigwame, which usually could mean either translation or interpretation, and then Andimta. I see some people using, uh, which, you know, and one more meaning. Uh, I see them using it um, kind of interchangeably, but can you... Um, can you talk about, and then I've even heard that andimta itself means when there's more than one meaning to a text where if it's one meaning, they'll say bo. Um, like, could you talk about the difference between tirigwami and andimta? Uh, andimta is Amharic commentary on Ge'ez text. Tirigwami, I think the one thing that you can say about it, it's, is that it is completely in Ge'ez, um, you, you know, you do see some of the style, stylistic, it, it's not uniform though. Andimta has been not only, it's not only, let me rephrase that. It's not only that it is an Amharic commentary on a Giz text, it is formulized. So it, it's been crystallized into this, in, into this um, singular tradition. You see what I'm saying? The Tirugwami, you know, it's going to be in Giz and you don't know what you're going to find. It could be flowing commentary. Um, it could be, um, uh, uh, it could have the bow. It could have, like, as there, to, to say there is uh, um, uh, uh, someone who interprets like this, or uh, thus said so-and-so, John Chrysostom, thus said John Chrysostom, thus said Cyril, of Alexandria, thus said um, a, a, a local um, uh, um, exegete, etc. So the difference is that one, the language of the commentary is is Amharic or Giz. They're, they're different. Two, the Andamta is um, uniform, and the Tirugwami is not. You, you you don't know what you're gonna find. The Tirugwami could also be translated from Arabic. It might not even be clear sometimes what it's saying because the grammar is trying to um, stick to the Arabic or the Syriac, whatever it was translated from. Usually it's Arabic even if it came from Syriac, it seems. So it'll be an Arabic translation of a Syriac uh, a commentary. Um, so that's what you have. Andamta is going to be Amharic and it's going to be formalized. That's very good. I was just discussing kind of contemporary or modern dialects of Amharic as part of my language nerdiness at Thanksgiving. It, well, one of my aunts couldn't help but commenting on my Amharic, my spoken Amharic, 
uh, is a strange mix depending on my context of Arada Amharic or street Amharic from Addis Sababa mixed with 20th and 21st century uh, church Amharic, a mutual friend of ours, Asis Mabratu, a scholar in his own right of the liturgy and of uh, the Christology of the church. He once said, you speak like the Bible. <laughs> um, uh, hanging around monks and reading the Bible does that to you. I was explaining to my sister Addis Ababa and then Diredawa especially, and, and to some extent Harar, are considered the rudest form of contemporary Amharic, uh, highly slang written and and almost crude things that you say there, if you were in the Amhara rural setting, uh, might get you killed, it might get members of your family killed. The, the, I love the word crystallized that you said of this. Some uh, scholars in the West who write in English, uh, you can find on ResearchGate and academia.edu, uh, even like uh, the late great professor Getacho Haile, they refer to this as old Amharic, capital O, old like Bului Amharic or old Amharic. I'm wondering what you can say about people who want to engage in this type of research that you've done, uh, because I would I would categorize you as one of the like best Amharic. Uh, I don't I want to phrase it right because you were you were you were back home but you came as a kid. If you were born here, I'd easily give it to you. But <laughs> uh, I, I give you a little bit of cheating because you came from back home. Uh, but as a as a kid, really. As a ba uh, as a baby, <laughs> as a baby, I still yeah, I still it's an asterisk. But yeah, you, it's you, a gray area. Needless to say, your Amharic is very excellent, but it's not so approachable. And I wonder what you could say about the old Amharic, especially if there are either younger deacons or anyone of interest in the church who wants to get into this, uh, dig into this commentary or on Dimta literature. What can you say about the old Amharic and anything that can be done to kind of prepare oneself for it um i don't i don't think you can prepare uh because e even i need help with the amharic uh and and even the people i reached out to they didn't know what it was saying either uh so it's a gondarine amharic and i have a lot of uh close friends from there and uh you know sometimes i've had to call them like what in the world is this talking about it just makes no sense and they were like let me call someone and ask also um so, so you know you're not really going to it is old it, it is old uh, amharic and um you're you know if you're if you're extremely fluent that's good that's a good point to get to and and but then you know it, it's not like you're not going to have an issue with it you're definitely going to have an issue with the amharic that you find in the andamta at all times I've I've never found I've never met anyone um, in my personal life outside of clergy that knew what it was talking about, and even uh, those um, uh, who are um, traditional scholars, those people I know who are traditional scholars have also um, looked at it like you know it just needs to be fixed. It's old, like the Amharic, um, and and so I, I should also mention that there's a difference um between the printed edition which sticks to the old classical gondarin amharic and let's say um yenita demsa at baata his is more clear um and i and and, and i have because you um, he has print books as well you mean like the spoken version that he does uh so even his handwritten uh um so I have access through a friend to his handwritten commentaries. Um, so his son um, is a friend of mine, and I have access to the handwritten commentaries. Um, you know, uh, they the Amharic is much more clearer, uh, and so you know it, it's not a problem you're not going to run into, no matter how good you are. Uh, I, everyone does, e even those. Um, even some you know it was, some of the scholars have had to modify it like uh, at baata um you know they, 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 it's just lacking um but it is a good if you want to study uh, old amharic you know good for you because this thing has just preserved it if if you're there just for the for the linguistic aspect of you know you want to and and there's people that want to study Amharic. There there's some interesting papers on it that I've read uh, just about old Amharic, and they almost always have to rely on the Andamta because it is just a a, a, a great um, collection of uh, not only old grammar 
uh, and syntax, but um, references to material, the material culture that you just really aren't not going to find anywhere. That that's so great because um, I have heard and been exposed to so many cultural anthropologists with uh, all due respect from which I believe a lot of the filth of secular scholarship comes from. And one thing that they have to like appreciate is, for example, the early Russian Orthodox Church entering Alaska and helping the American Indian or Inuit natives there preserve their language by consigning it to a text and having a certain corpus of biblical literature that then other people, even if they're not interested in the work of the Orthodox Church, could then use to, to piece together their language. So you're saying to me, even if there are other interests that are not church-oriented or Amharic studying this corpus, which you have in the Andimta corpus, is going to be beneficial to, to them as well. I wanted to move to one of the other uh which People. is real quick, which is also the case in the Bible. You have to you have to understand that the Bible is also a preservation of a particular people's uh, their language and their culture. And so, when you um, go to interpret the text or understand the text, you have to understand that that's what it is. And 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 so it, this is also the case here in the Andamta. It is encapsulating a, a certain language, a certain time period, a certain culture. Just like also the Quran, which is the encapsulation of the uh, Quranic Arabic, and so the classical Arabic, that is where you have to go to uh, learn it. If I'm not mistaken, I, I, I'm not a student of the Quran uh, or of classical Arabic, but those who do study it uh, inform me that that is the case. Yeah, neither am I. And I actually, just saw a non-Muslim guy who had passages of the Quran memorized, and he was shocking this random. Muslim guy and he was like why do you know this stuff and it's for the same reasons that that you and I are talking about and when you were discussing the Septuagint translation I think you made this point as well I don't know if people caught it biblical translations are usually called word for word or thought for thought literal or dynamic and I think you were saying it's more on the literal side of that spectrum it is a spectrum and you see uh, you know, the message is famously, and the Patois or Jamaican version of the Bible or the Hawaiian pidgin version, famous, very famous thought for thought versions. And then there are arguable other uh, literal translation. I have David Bentley Hartz, which I recently read uh, for some faithful in Las Vegas. His, uh, although I, I'm not a big fan of his universalism as well, I think his uh, translation of scripture is very excellent in its literalness. On the other side, I have N.T. Wright's. Uh, who is on the extreme thought for thought end because you, you, you got to be able to look at, at at both of these things to see what they're trying to to do if you're a serious student of scripture. But you have this, um, the character of Merakha Dingil who occupies um, chapter four as well. And chapter four is, in, in fact, uh, he's eponymous there. His title, the title of chapter four is Merakha Dingil's Commentary. What can you say about Merakha Dingil, the man and his commentary? The man, uh, he was he was in some shape or form a student of the um, the, the legendary uh, abbot of uh, Deradivanos Itchage uh, in Bakom or abbot Itchage abbot in Bakom. Um, I try to piece together to what extent he was his disciple uh, by uh, laying side by side their life and and timeline um, based off of. Uh, where the Jesuits found them, so there was a Jesuit mission, and you know they have letters that were translated from Latin, and it looks like he would have only had twenty years. Uh, and for Mirkadinga, it was the first, approximately. You you have the book in your hand, uh, approximately the first twenty years of his life. It looks like to have learned from Envakom, and so um, I speculate that um, he is referencing that his knowledge of languages may have come from Inabakom, who was legendary in in his uh in his it, because of his knowledge of so many languages uh so he may have learned arabic from him or he may have been relying on an arabic um um study book or something that he put together uh, Inabakom had books where he uh, played with Portuguese grammar, 
uh, Coptic, Syriac. Wow. Uh, yeah, so he was reading books in Portuguese with the Jesuit missionaries. Um, he, he was doing, a, and I also found a, um, later on I found a uh, manuscript of a translation of the letter of Paul to the Romans. It looks like it was made directly from Greek and it sticks to the Greek, which the other, you know, the, the other, there's not, there's, there's not examples, many of that for the book of Romans. And they also found together with that manuscript, a vocabulary of uh, Coptic and, and so on. So it looked like this person uh, was a philologist, a lover of languages uh, also. So it's, you know, it's also probably why it looks like it's in Bakom. But anyways, um, he wrote a commentary on the Torah. Uh, and uh, here strictly uh, meaning the first five books. Um, yes. And uh, so in his commentary on the Torah, and he's also been the same Merkatengad has been identified as the chronicle writer of Susunios's chronicle, at least half of it. And so uh, I contrast the two texts and I extract from them his, um, what sh how should I phrase this? His understanding of uh, the, the elect of God who suffer. Uh, so th there, there's a point and it's interesting because as a biblical scholar himself, who is in a position to write He's in this position to write the Chronicle of the Emperor. You see in the beginning that he lays out a hermeneutic pattern. And it was just so surprising to me that, you know, you'd find the, you know, the, the murder weapon or, or, or you know, or, uh, uh, so to speak. It's just like highlighted in bold right there that, you know, it's, it, I think it's more evidence that he wrote it. Uh, so I don't know how certain the evidence was that he wrote it, but it's extremely certain because there's this pattern in which he wants the, the hearer of this text to understand that his misfortunes were not due to him being a bad person. Misfortunes don't simply fall bad people, they fall, befall good people also. Uh, and especially there's a pattern where God's elect are uh, uh, put in a position of suffering. And so he goes at, 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 a, at a significant amount of length to show this, and he brings up Joseph. And surprisingly, uh, also, the Andamta makes reference to him, and it makes reference to almost no one. Um, and so I use that reference that it makes of him to even, you know, it's the third nail in the coffin to prove the point that I'm proving. Um, and it is, and it's just also surprising the reference they that, that the Andamta makes of him. If I'm not mistaken, it's in the commentary on Matthew, and it says that his name was his title was Kesazi because he was um, the the um, the confessor to the emperor. Um, they said he used to he used to sew embroidery on his clothes. Um, and his edit to Genesis 37 is in reference to Joseph's embroidered clothes. And so he has this um, typological pattern that he set on Joseph. He, I mean, he didn't do it. He's just a student of, uh, of, of biblical hermeneutics. And that is how Joseph is seen. And um, Th that's that that's the interesting the readers will have to read it but that is what is so interesting and 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 the the importance of biblical uh, figures such as Joseph is that the church understands them as being a type that points that foreshadow Christ and um Paul who was the interpreter of the Old Testament to the church lays this out uh pretty clearly um, in, in Romans, he has, um, he uses an antitype of, of Adam. Uh, but other than that, 
uh, antitype as a polar opposite of, of, of Christ, who's the second Adam, but in other places you see the types in, in the Old Testament that um, that he, he said that that Paul presents as the uh, prefiguring of of Christ, and so the church who received the apostolic tradition um, and the apostolic tradition is a particular interpretation of the Old Testament in light of the messianic event that uh, uh, Christ claimed uh, to have been, uh, and uh, so you you see how Mirkadengil who um, egg interpreted the scriptures in continuation of the churches, the way the church interprets the scripture. So to be a church, you know, you have to, um, uh, you know, it's not just about like, you want to, it's not just about admiring Christ or, or so on. It's an, it's a perspective of the oracles of Israel. It's, it's a interpretation in a, as in, in the messianic culmination of Jesus. And uh, it is the acceptance of the apostolic teaching because that was one of Jesus' teachings, that he's handing over these things to the apostles, and there are no others. The apostles, the church fathers are not the apostles. The apostles are the apostles, and it was given to them to, uh, just like the oracles of Israel, to hand over the oracles of the new Israel. And so you see this uh, excellent set of evidences um i don't think you should expect to find something like that again um uh the previous scholarship on the andimta was not so lucky um i, I think I, I i think i lucked out and um you know things aligned and uh it, it is just irrefutable and um you see this interesting circle of, uh, you know, because the Andamta does not make references to people, and if it does, it's in it's in passing very briefly, um, and, you know, you want, it leaves you in want for more biographical information. So the biographical information is there. You find non-biblical work of this, of this author, and just as you would expect from a, a, a someone of, who is, um, immersed in biblical scholarship, you see him revealing the way he understands scripture, and he's trying to tell the chronic those who would hear the chronicles of Susanios, hey, this is how you interpret uh, the people that God has chosen and their suffering. What does it mean? And where does he get that from? It's rooted in the Pauline interpretation of 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 the old of the oracles of the Old Testament, and um, in the church's understanding of Joseph, particularly in that vein of the of the of the typos that Paul refers to, the typology, and um, uh, and then you see the overarching theme that he corrects the text of Genesis thirty-seven, and it even looks like beyond the scope of this study that the Old Testament for in in, in the Ethiopian tradition was edited by this um by this scholar and the reading that he used to correct it you find it back in the first century it's just very interesting you find yeah, it you find it in the first century in origins hexapla sorry and it, it it goes to that uh, a, a body of work that preserved initially the uh variants that it found in the greek versions of of the old testament and then the uh, Hebrew also. I think that's encouraging the impact that even one man can have. The analogy you're making between like Joseph in Pharaoh's court, not Joseph the righteous, right? We're in the Old Testament. Joseph uh, and not Joseph of Arimathea, who we sing about during the Paschal season as well. But um, Joseph from the Old Testament in the court of Pharaoh and then Merkadengel is in the court of Emperor Susneos, I, it's, uh, I have personal reasons for being interested in Emperor Susneos, but it, it reminds me of something that Professor Taddasa Tamrat wrote about in his church and state that people forget about, it's the American revolution. 
in the 1770s and 1780s that really propagates this idea throughout the world until it's a meme that church and state are totally separate. And there's an extent to which it's true in the early church because of the persecution of Chris, of uh, Christians in the, in the age of the martyrs there. But um, yeah, what do you make of Mirka Dingil being uh, a Kesa Ase? Now for 50 years, uh, there's been, I would say uh, enmity, although it looked like two years of not so much enmity, but we're back right back at the enmity when we look at the situation in Ethiopia between uh, church and state. Um, I, I know our brother Deacon Mahadi is is very wary of it because he's wary of the untoward influence that the state could have on the church. Um, but frankly speaking, a lot of a lot of the people in the state, whether at the highest level like the Emperor Susneos or lower level dukes, were the patrons of these uh, of these of these most learned people like Mirkad. Yeah, um, I won't comment on current current politics, but I will comment on the 16th politics in the 1600s. Um, I don't think Mirka Dingil agreed with Susnios. Um, and I show that later it, it, before the closing of that chapter. It looks like, you know, Susnios is remembered as wanting to convert Ethiopia to Catholicism. Yes. His reason, his desire to do so is is um not i do not think it's supported by um america Dingel, but his reason for doing so is uh also a concern for america Dingel. they're both concerned about the lack of literacy of the clergy um and america Dingel's approach was to and you see it in the polyphon of of the manuscript of his Tirugwami Orit, which was a Giz by Giz Tirugwami. So I closed the book out by looking at a, uh, not an Andimta, uh, but but as a, I, I, look, I look at, to close out, I look at a, a, a Tirugwami, which we said was Giz on Giz, um, as a hypothesis test. I say it that, okay, I looked at the literary data in the Andimta, this is a, a, a hypothesis test to um, uh, see if this, concept was at play um and i showed that it was but at the end of this colophon of his commentary you see that he, he was trying to side with the syrian church so he wanted the ethiopian church to come under the um management of the syrian church he he wanted the coptic church out he didn't want it removed via uh, uh, the the Catholic Church and and Susanius had a reason for siding with the Catholics. Um, it was because their interpretations, their writings, um, were very logical. Uh, they 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 were intelligent. They were um, uh, uh, jacks of many trades. You know, they built bridges. They built they they built their own monasteries uh, with very good architecture and so on and, and you know he, he he looks at the egyptian um metropolitan and the metropolitan is not concerned with anything but the accumulation of wealth and much wealth has been accumulated by him um and he is not even uh living in accordance with the uh law of the land uh i think around emperor Galaudios's period, um, it was illegal to have to be married to more than one woman or something. And you know, certainly the issue is like this bishop has many women under him, but he's a monk, so he can't even take him to court because you know it's clear what he's doing with the women, but um, it's easy. To deny it in, in in a court of law because you know he's a monk he's not married he 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 just detested these things and the ignorance of the clergy so the the proximity of Susnios with Mirkadengel shouldn't I do, don't think it should be con confused with uh, an ideological proximity um, the and and I think the closing the colophon of his commentary points to the fact that what he was working on. Uh, and and 
his desire for the Ethiopian church was that it would come under the uh, leadership of of the Syrian church and uh, the, the if he says the Jacobite he used the term the Jacobite church and and um, um, I, I wanted to uh, say that about because um, when we say their names together I, I don't want I don't want the uh, understanding to be that their ideologies were necessarily together there's no proof for that the proof is uh, a little bit um, in, in a separate direction I, I understand it very well and um, it was around 2011 in the fall when I lived in DC actually and when I was starting to come back in church my senior year of college I was working under then Congressman Dennis Kucinich, who was a, a man known uh, as being very much on the left and a man known being very much on the right was his good friend, Dr. Paul. And they were both, when I was working as his legislative intern, looking into, for example, the Federal Reserve Bank. And what's fascinating is it matches exactly what you're saying. The critique that they had about the bankers was the same their conclusions were different. So I think it's fair to say that Emperor Susanios and uh, Mehmet Kadingil, they're looking at similar ills in their society, but the, uh, descriptively, but their normative claims for what are to be done about those ills or their conclusions are different. And I think that's that's fair for people to, to share critiques, but to, um, to differ on conclusions. The other thing that stuck out to me about what you were saying, especially about the editing of the text and the variance in Genesis 37, is I grew up in middle school watching Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat play or musical. I don't know if you've ever- Me too. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, it's big, right? So um, I wonder if you had anything more to say about that typology, because I think um, that that leap to seeing Christ in the Old Testament is where a lot of people fail. Again, another Thanksgiving conversation I was having with somebody trying to convince them to come on our side, so to speak. Uh, they were more on the secular side, not not on the um, backwards literalism, but they, they were struggling with uh, a literal kind of interpretation of the Old Testament and not really seeing uh, Christ there. So if there was anything more you had to say about the typology of the dream coat and it's such an amazing detail that Merkad Dengel had something uh, sewn, is, sewn in as well. Yeah, um, uh, so th the basis for it is the Pauline teaching that, that, that the figures and the institutions of the Old Testament prefigure, uh, uh, the, the prefigure Christ and, and that is the basis and that is the apostolic uh, uh, teaching right there. So, uh, going a little bit beyond that, um, the the coat in the patristic writings. Um, so Paul does not mention, if I'm not mistaken, Joseph as a type. But he mentions that the Old Testament uh, uh, was a type of uh, Christ. And so, by the way, you see these things in the Gospels, not just in the letters. So it, it's evident that that this idea, um, uh, what's clearly said uh, typologically is, for example, things um, that he met Paul talks about Adam. And this idea is clearly seen not just in Paul's letters, but in the Gospels. Um, Joseph, uh, uh, you know, you would see why that the, the typological pattern would be applied to Joseph very easily. We, we're not going to go into that, but to come to your aunt question about the coat, um, the coat is seen by um, later uh, um, uh, authors of the church of, from from the category of the church fathers. The, so in the so it's in the patristic writing, the coat is seen um, as the. Uh, and I have Epiphanius's quote, if you want to read it there, that um, uh, it, it's it's the divinity um, and the body of, of Christ and that the blood did not touch the divinity uh, and, and and so on. And so Paul, um, Joseph, who was sold by his brothers, um, um, Christ, who was sold by his brethren, his countrymen, um, uh, and so on. Um, so it, it's it's understood in it, it, within 
the theology of clothing and declothing that the um, we mentioned that the Syrian um, uh, commentator Saint Ephraim the Syrian had, and and um, so this is this is how he understood it. But when we stick more closely to, and I think it always we always have to make a distinction to not impose the church fathers' view on the text. Like you have to always be careful. I think it's easier to to uh, uh, not take too much care when it's someone like John Chrysostom who is already like, adamantly careful to present the text in its in its um, uh, 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 splendor. Huh? I said splendor or in glory it, in its meaning in its direct meaning and not in what. And not in, in in not him engaging in philosophy and so on. So he's 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 looking at the text. What did the author? What was the author trying to convey to the people it was written to? And so you know you have to be careful. But when you stick primarily to the Pauline um, structure of typology, um, uh, the, the Joseph is about the su the suffering elect of God. That's kind of like the bare uh, uh, minimum. Uh, you know the apostolic just the framework and um and that is certainly what um at the core what Mercat Engel was trying to get at because he's talking about how to understand the uh suffering of the elect because um logic and superstition will make will, would have you think that the suffering is a curse and um and Paul Who's conveying typology on the basis of the messianic event, uh, 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 which is about a Messiah that suffered and and died, uh, you know, is not. It it does not follow that suffering in the Christian um, understanding is a curse or a. Um, I shouldn't say curse, but it is not something that befalls the evil people. It's it's also something that that befalls the elect, and uh, that is what um, he's getting at. Because we see that that's how he presents the evils that befall the emperor, who is elect uh, of God to rule the country in his chronicle chapters. All you know, also in you know, be care, being careful to um, speak of everything in its context in the chronicle chapters. Why did the emperor? Uh, be, uh, ha come across so many evils and 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 uh, why did he befall so much suffering? Well, let me tell you, it's not because he is necessarily evil because you know he uses the uh, Joseph as 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 the um, as the basis for that, which I, like I said again, it is something that he gets from the Pauline interpretation of the uh, old Te Old Testament oracles. In light of the uh, messianic uh, uh, event of, of of Jesus, and that's the power of the Word of God is that this was written centuries ago, talking about an old false teaching. It reminds you of Ecclesiastes that there is nothing new under the sun, because it it is a sword that slashes into the future at all of the prosperity gospel teachers, the Joel Olsteins, the Creflo Dollars of this world. Who will tell you that if you're suffering, uh, there's there's some issue with you, and if you're rich, that's that's how you know you're highly favored. They say blessed and highly favored a lot on social media these days, um, forgetting the suffering. And I know outside of the scope of this book of yours, you and I had looked at some works of Maris Marisak or Saint Isaac the Syrian, who who very often covers this idea of the suffering elect of God. And uh, somehow also what came to my mind as you were talking about the clothing connection between uh, the patristic source of St. Ephraim as well as the commentary here on Joseph is uh, this idea from Romans, with bo which both you and I have looked at. I, I covered it on my Tawadu Bible study, and I know you've been using it locally to teach the youth. But uh, from Romans 13, you have verse 14, but put on the Lord jesus christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts so this clothing declothing language it's it's everywhere the old testament is is within the new and uh, the new is the interpretive tool of that and we see people 
from all, so all sorts of centuries and times and places in your book, The Letter That Kills, doing that. In conclusion, could you tell people where they can find uh, their own copy of The Letter That Kills and um, any any sort of concluding marks that you have or uh, uh, always, uh, Zema is always welcome as well, but whatever concluding remarks you have, yeah, you can find it. Um, you can find it on Amazon. I think you're going to provide a link because uh, this is your video. Um, uh, yeah. So in in conclusion, this the, the the effort of this study was in order to present. It does several things, but one of the the big things, the bi main aims, is to prevent is to present a framework for the progress of biblical. Uh, studies for the Ethiopian Church, and and it 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 does that in in very clear, clear terms, and it does that from its own voice. And 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 all I'm doing is presenting um, the paradigm, and and it's not a new thing. It's it, it, it but it is through the ways that the scholars of the past have done it. And the the tools, even in the commentary tradition that he, that they have laid out for us, um, those things have to be, I think, taken seriously, because uh, if that is not done, um, I think the state of biblical scholarship in the church right now it is, you know, I have to be careful with my words, but it is. It's very bad, and um, it it if if you look at the traditional scholars in the book and all all the efforts and it, you know you see what they did, how they did it, not only not only what they left behind that is good and profitable, but you see the efforts they took to learn more and to progress. Um, you don't have that now, and. Um, I, I always, you know, when I was younger, I thought I would see a certain progress because a lot of this, a lot of the things that that are preserved in the Ethiopian Church have not really been um, um, studied or it advanced in, in in any way, and so um, that has not happened. And so what I'm what I'm presenting. Um, in at least an initial step is a, a, a way to move forward while staying faithful to the to the work that's been done in the past thank you so much for coming back on the program i look forward to my audience and others eating your book and to you producing many more thank you